Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? just come from Dr. Elston. It's my eyes. I, I'm on the verge of going blind. Another Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the extraordinary story of In the Dark. Thomas Northcott was a very busy man, a marine architect, a wealthy shipbuilder. And by the summer of 1940, he found himself working harder than ever and longer hours. He became the victim of severe headaches. So finally, he visited his friend and physician, Dr. John Elston. The pain isn't constant, you say, Tom? No, it comes and goes. But when it strikes, it's almost unbearable been working unusually long hours, haven't you? Yes. All day and for the past six months till midnight. What do you think is wrong with me? Well, when a man passes 40, he's subject to a lot more things than when he's younger. Yes, but what is wrong with me? Pretty exacting work, yours. Why don't you tell me? Can't afford to spend the day here. Oh, don't get excited. Calm down, I'll tell you. You won't like to hear it. What? You... You don't think I'm losing my mind? I didn't say that. But that's what you mean. Please, Tom. That's ridiculous. Why, I... Known all about my family for 200 years back. Not a trace of insanity in one of them. I said nothing about insanity. Well, then, what are you talking about? Well, it is possible, however, to throw yourself completely off balance by overwork. Worry, mental strain. I know, I know. Your nerves are shot to pieces. What does Elizabeth think about your working like this? I don't know. What can she say? It's got to be done. Well, Tom, you're going to let someone else do it for a while. What? I mean it. You're headed for a nervous breakdown. And something else. What else? Blindness. Good heavens. You have an eye condition which has become aggravated by environment. What can be done about it? Stop work immediately, rest. Get outdoors, get away. For how long? Months at least, maybe longer. Put that yacht you built to some use. It's been tied up for over a year. Are you sure about all this? Positive. All right, John. I have no choice in the matter. I'll drop in again in a few days. Of course. Goodbye, Tom. So Tom, completely flabbergasted, goes back to his office and tries to finish some plans and specifications. But he cannot keep his mind on the work, so he goes home early. Well, good evening, Mr. Northcott. Good evening, Billings. Uh, this is most unusual. I, I mean, uh, we didn't expect you for dinner. I know, I didn't feel so well this afternoon. I'm sorry, sir. Isn't Elizabeth having dinner here? Uh, no, sir. Mrs. Northcott hasn't had dinner in for several weeks. I didn't know that. Uh, she's been going out every evening. Well, I don't want much something uh, like... Uh, very good, sir. Oh, uh, there's a letter for you in oh, the library. A letter? Yes, sir. Thanks, Billings. Letter, eh? Certainly not a business letter. No return address. Your wife, Elizabeth, got this way from a certain man. It's going to be a scandal in this town that you won't like. A friend. Good heavens. Stay away from a certain man. Billings. Billings! Yes, Mr. Northcott? Do you know where Mrs. Northcott has gone? No. Did she say who she was to meet? No, she never does. Just goes out for the evening? Oh, sometimes in the afternoon as well. I see. Uh, you look a bit pale, sir. Shall I call Dr. Elson? No, Billings, I... I don't think he could be of much help. I'll be all right. Good night. Tom moves slowly up the stairs to his room and goes to bed. He has difficulty falling asleep, stares into the darkness, and through his mind runs the phrase, certain man, a certain man. But what man? Finally, he drops off to sleep. He rises early and without seeing Elizabeth goes to the office to wind up his affairs. Then arrives home early again. But Elizabeth is not there. 
Elizabeth is sitting in a cocktail lounge with Charles Carroll, her attorney. I never see Tom anymore. He leaves early, comes in late. Nothing but business, business, business. I just can't go on like this. It's driving me mad. You're no different from a lot of women in this country. Production is speeded up and there's nothing a man can do about it. But if Tom loved me, he could find a little time to spend with me. You still love Tom. I did. But his indifference has made me cold as a cucumber. Yes, but you have everything. Money, position. Why throw it away? This condition may only be temporary. I can't understand you, Charles. We went through puppy love together. Went through school together. Then we drifted apart and I met Tom. Why can't you understand me? Because... For three weeks now, and I've seen you almost every day, you, of all people, have been trying to talk me out of divorcing, Tom. That's right. But do you want me to go on like this? I want you to be sure, Elizabeth. I am sure. Are you afraid you'll lose some business if I divorce Tom with you as my attorney? Elizabeth, you know I'm terribly fond of you. I always have been and always will be. Your happiness means a great deal to me. That's why I don't want you to take this step until we're sure that you'll not be sorry later. You're the one who isn't sure. Darling, it's for your own good. Please wait. All right, Charles. That's the way you feel, I'll wait. Good. Can you drop me off at my place? Yes, I can. Uh, But... But what? Well, look, Elizabeth, I'm going to be very busy for the next two or three days. And we've talked over this situation for weeks, so... Suppose you think on it for a while and... Make up your own mind. Then call me. Why, of course, Charles. I have been taking a lot of your time lately. I'm sorry. It's all right, darling. Come along. Charles takes Elizabeth home and leaves her at the door. Tom Northcott is in the library waiting, waiting for Elizabeth. Tom? What on earth are you doing home so early? I... Well, I'm certainly surprised. Are you? What's happened? What did you do this afternoon? The same thing I do every afternoon and every evening. Try to kill time. I suppose it has been rather boring lately, since I've had to spend so much time at the plant. Yes, it has. Been playing bridge a lot, have you? Yes. Bridge and parties. Oh, there are a number of things one can do when one has to. I'm sorry, Elizabeth, but this extra heavy load of business is not of my own making. I thought you would understand. I understand that you work hard, that you're very busy. But even when you're here, you seem to be completely unaware of my presence. You come in late, go to your room without a word, get up with the birds and leave without a word. I wasn't aware of that. But I suppose it's true. I was able to stand it at first. And then I became horribly lonely. So lonely, I couldn't bear this house another moment. So I started going out here and there. That should have helped? For a while. You had changed, Tom. I did attribute it to business, but when you changed so completely, became so indifferent toward me, I suddenly realized that you no longer loved me. And then I changed. You changed? Yes. Finding some way to occupy my time is no longer the difficulty. No? What is the difficulty? My difficulty is forcing myself to come back to this empty shell each night. You think I... I don't care for you? What else could I think? You're saying you've lost your affection for me. Yes. And you found someone who is more... more attentive? I have many friends whose company is most pleasant. A man? Friends. Men and women. Friends who understand. Elizabeth, they don't understand. And you don't understand. In another moment, you'll be telling me you want to leave me. I do. I can't stay here any longer. Then we'll both leave. Together. What? This is all a complete misunderstanding, Elizabeth. We love each other, regardless of what you think. This can be remedied very easily. No, Tom. Please listen to me. I I need your help. Help? What do you mean? For some time now, I, I've been ill. I've said nothing about it, but it's grown worse. The pain has increased. Pain? Yes. In my head. In my eyes. Flashes of light. I, I want to see Dr. Elston. John. Yes, Dr. Elston. He told me that I must quit work. Take a complete rest, or go blind. Blind? Oh, Tom, how awful. We'll take the yacht, Elizabeth. A long cruise. It'll save my sight, and it'll help us, too. We can pick up where we apparently left off. But, Tom, Please, Elizabeth, you... I need you. All right, Tom. I'll go. We can leave in a few days. 
And we needn't go alone. If you prefer, we can have some guests along. Oh, would that help? Yes. Yes, I believe it would. Very well. Uh, who would you like? You select someone you'd like to have along, and I'll select someone. Uh, people we both know. Yes. Well, I... I'd like to have... Yes? Dr. Elston. John. You'd like to have him along? Very much. He's charming company, and besides, he may prove valuable. And it's John Elston. I'll ask him tomorrow. And say, uh, how about Charles Carroll? Always like Charlie. And Marge Durant. They're, they're still engaged, aren't they? Why, I don't know. By George, Elizabeth, I'm going to enjoy this trip. I feel better already. I wonder if the doctor will join us. I'm sure he will. Well, if he turns me down, I'll let you talk to him. I'm sure you can persuade him. <laughs> Tom visits the doctor, John Elston, and after some persuasion, the doctor accepts the invitation. Then Tom runs into Marge Durant in the doctor's waiting room. Well, hello there, Marge. How are you? All right. Hmm, haven't seen you or Charlie in some time. How is Charlie? Oh, all right, I guess. You guess? Haven't you seen him? Don't tell me you two have broken off your engagement. Oh, no, not officially. Charles has been exceptionally busy for several weeks. Well, you mustn't be too hard on us men in times like these. We don't mean to be neglectful. No. I'm taking a cruise in the old yacht. We're going to leave in a few days. We've gone several weeks. How would you like to join us? Us? Yes. Elizabeth and me. And Dr. Elston. He's just accepted. Well, I'd love to go. We all need to get away from things now and then. We certainly do, but I don't... Oh, I've already asked Charlie. And he said he'd love to go, if I could persuade you to go. <laughs> Charles said that? He did. So you'll have a chance to see him every day. Well... I'll be tickled to death to join you. Good. The party's complete. Come aboard Saturday night. We'll sail early in the morning. See you later, Marge. Now it is Saturday evening, the eve of departure. After an early dinner, Tom, suffering from severe head pain, goes to the library where he dozes in an armchair. Tom? Tom? Tom, wake up. Huh? What? Oh, Elizabeth. Oh, I must have had quite a nap. Well, the pains are gone. I'm glad of that. It's 8.30. we better leave for the yacht. 8.30? Good heavens. Turn on the lights, Elizabeth. What? Push the switch. Tom? What's wrong, Elizabeth? Tom, the, the lights are on. What? Elizabeth. Yes, I... I just turned them on. Good Lord. It's happened. Oh, Tom, I'm terribly sorry. Shall I call the doctor? No. No, wait. We'd better cancel the trip. No, no, please. I, I'd rather go on. And I'd rather we didn't say anything about this. I, I'm sure it'll pass. We'll go ahead. And I'll bluff it through for a while. You'll help me. Won't you, Elizabeth? Yes, Tom, I... I'll help you. Tom notifies his skipper that he'll be late in coming aboard. Then when he is sure his guests on the yacht have retired, he and Elizabeth arrive, and he goes to his cabin. Next morning, the guests lounge in the sun on the after deck. Tom appears and moves along the deck to the stern. Stops and leaning against the rail, lights his pipe. Morning, everybody. Wonderful day, isn't it? Yeah, clear as crystal. Where are we going? Does it matter, Marge? This is a cruise to nowhere. <laughs> the less we know about where we're going, the bigger surprise we get when we get there. Well, don't you know? No, my skipper does. Makes it more interesting, don't you think, Dad? I suppose so. That was Elizabeth's idea. Wasn't it? Are you asking us? Oh, uh... I thought Elizabeth... That is, uh, I thought she told you. It's a swell idea, just the same. Hey, Charles? Yeah, it's all right with me. Hope the weather stays like this. Yes, I was wondering about those dark clouds gathering off there. They mean anything, Tom? Oh, yeah, yes. Well, maybe, maybe not. Pretty black, aren't they? Yes, yes, they are. Where are you looking? 
Over here, Tom, on the port side. Huh? Oh, 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 those. Well, they are dark, but we may see them for days and never contact them. I hope you're right. I'm not much of a sailor. No? How about you, Elizabeth? Oh, good morning, dear. Sleep well? I've had the best rest in years. You look lovely this morning. Tom. Tom, what's wrong with you? What do you mean? Good morning, folks. Sorry to be such a sleepy head, but I was dead tired. How do you feel, Tom? Why, I... I... Confound it, my best pipe. I'll get it. Wait a minute. If Tom can get it, it's right at his feet. Tom. Here it is, Tom. When this happened? Last... Last evening. You weren't going to tell me. I'm going to bluff it through. Yes, sir. You knew it was going to happen this soon, but you said if I took a rest, it'd be all right. I didn't want to alarm you. I hoped my diagnosis was wrong. But you knew it wasn't. I... I... I'm sorry. Tell Captain Baker I want to see him in my cabin. Please forget all this and try to enjoy yourself. I'll help you to your cabin, Tom. No, thanks, Charlie. I... I designed this ship. I built it. I know every corner and cranny. What a rotten shame. Poor Tom. Poor fellow. That evening after dinner, Elizabeth visits Dr. Elston in his cabin. Half hour later, Tom gropes his way along the rolling deck toward the doctor's room. Elizabeth has just left. Did you say come in, doctor? I couldn't quite hear storm coming up. Yes, of course. Come in, Tom. I wanted to talk with you, John, before I turned in. Certainly. Sit down, Tom. Yes. Uh, here we are. Not a bad storm. Not bad at all. This will blow over. Yes, I suppose so. Hmm. That's strange. That odor. You don't smoke, do you, John? <laughs> well, once in a while. Why? I smell a strong odor of tobacco. The same peculiar aromatic blend Elizabeth uses. Well, it's quite possible. Elizabeth was just here. Really? Poor girl. She's terribly upset about me. Came to talk over my condition? Yes, she's quite worried. I can imagine. And you're worried, too. Aren't you, John? Well, I... I'm concerned. Oh, that's a terrible thing. One can't possibly realize how terrifying it is until it happens to him. I think I can fully appreciate it, Tom. Can you? I wonder. I think you better turn in. Well, perhaps you're right. I should steel myself against sympathy. Sympathy of others and sympathy for myself. Poor Elizabeth. I feel sorriest for her. What a fate. To be tied down to a blind man for the rest of her life. She'll understand. I'll look after Elizabeth. Will you, John? That's awfully good of you. I appreciate that. Better run along to bed, Tom. Get all the rest you can. Yes. Yes, of course. Good night, John. Good night. The next evening after dinner, Elizabeth is in her cabin. Elizabeth feigned seasickness and did not appear. So Charlie Carroll goes to her room. You're not seasick, Elizabeth. You and I have sailed rougher water than these. But I don't want anything to eat, Charles. Now, please, darling, you can't go on like this. You've got to pull yourself together. I know, I know. What am I going to do? I'm bewildered. A few days ago, I was positive he didn't love me and I didn't love him. Now this happens and everything has changed. How do you mean? Well, now I'm sorry for him. And the indifference has changed to something else. Change to pity? Perhaps that's it. You mean you don't want to divorce him now? I don't see how I could. Afraid of what people would say? Oh, no. But somehow it just doesn't seem right. Now Tom's different. Maybe it took this darkness to show him the light. I mean... Oh, I don't know what I mean. No, no. Elizabeth. <laughs> Come on, darling, get a hold of yourself. Oh, Charles. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Don't say anything, darling. Everything will turn out all right. I know what to do. Charles, you're a darling. I don't know what I'd have done without you all these long weeks. Now, I'll just take it easy. Well, I... take a look at that, Doctor. 
We certainly ought to apologize, but we were stricken dumb. Marge, what are you talking about? Oh, dear, the sweet little innocence. You give them a lecture on life, Doctor. Now, wait a minute, Marge. For three weeks, Charles has been busy, busy, busy. And this is why. What a nice way to be busy. Marge, please. You're jumping to conclusions. Jumping? Are you kidding? Charles has been avoiding me for three weeks, and there's the reason in all her glory. Marge, you're out of your mind. You can't believe such a thing. Of course not. Not unless I heard it. And I heard it and saw it. Tom would just love to hear about this. Marge, you mustn't. No? Watch me. Just watch me. Don't worry, Elizabeth. I'll stop her. What is it, Doctor? Come in. Tom, I want to talk to you. What do you want, Doctor? I want you to turn the ship around and go home. Oh, but that's silly. You needn't worry about me. I think you should turn around. What are you so upset about? I insist that you take the ship back. You seem frightened, Doctor. What do you anticipate? Uh, an unpleasant situation exists aboard the ship. What? I'd rather not say. But I don't want to return. Unless you can give me a good reason. Can you? I'd rather not say. You're afraid of me, aren't you? Certainly not. I know what's troubling you. You know that I know about you. You and Elizabeth. What? Well, you're crazy. You and my wife have been seeing each other for weeks and weeks. You realize now that I know the truth. You're afraid that I might do something drastic. That I might kill you. Such nonsense. Wait a minute. Is that why you were so insistent that I come on the trip? Maybe. I don't know where you got such an idea, but you're all mixed up. If she's been seeing anybody, it hasn't been me. <laughs> oh, come now. I didn't want to tell what I know, but I see now that I'll, I'll have to. You come with me to Elizabeth. Elizabeth? You expect me to believe that she'll tell the truth? You come along just the same. Let's wait till morning. Pretty rough weather tonight. Waves are breaking clear over the decks. No, I don't want to wait till morning. Now. Very well, Doctor. <laughs> if you insist. I'll lead the way. Uh, wouldn't want you to get washed over the side. That'd be too bad. We'll go around by the stern, up the other side. Look out, here comes a big one. Hang on. <clears throat> Doctor! Doctor, where are you? Doctor! I've got him, Mr. Northcott. He almost went over. Is he? All right, Captain. He got a deep wound in the back of his head. Must have struck the opposite rail when the wave hit. I think he's dead, Northcott. Dead? Good Lord. Uh, he's dead, all right. Uh, I'll get him off the deck before we hit another big one. Better get back to your quarters, Mr. Northcott. Hang on to the rail. Elizabeth. Are you here? Yes, Tom. What's wrong? Something terrible has happened. An accident. An accident? What is it? It's Dr. Elston. He's dead. Dead? What are you saying? He was coming along the after deck, and a big wave came over and washed him against the opposite side. Struck his head. The captain says he's dead. Well, why don't you say something? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Charlie, I, I didn't know you were here. She's fainted. Fainted? Really? Well, that's strange. Elizabeth. You're all right, darling. Here, drink this. John. John. Oh, John. Oh, here you are, Tom. You're just the one I wanted to see. Yes, Marge. What's the matter with her? She fainted when I informed her that Dr. Elston had been killed. Doctor, what happened? A big wave tossed him across the deck. He struck his head on the opposite rail. Oh, poor John. Let's turn back. I can't go on. And why can't you go on? I just can't. Please turn back. That's ridiculous. We'll have to bury him at sea, of course, but why shouldn't we go on? Are you out of your mind? No. Why are you so terribly upset about the doctor? Why? How can you ask such a thing? You sound as though you didn't care. Maybe I don't. But it's very obvious that you do. You're out of your mind. Would you faint if anything happened to me? No. But the doctor, that's different. What are you trying to say? What? You. You and the doctor. I found out days ago. You tried to blame me, but I know differently now. I received a letter from someone telling me that you were running around with a certain man. That man was John Elston. I never heard of such a lie. I haven't seen John in weeks. Who sent you that letter? I did. But I wasn't referring to John. You sent it. And who did you mean? I meant you. You and Elizabeth. You've been seeing each other every day for weeks. 
You and Elizabeth think you're clever, but you're not. You sent the letter? Yes. And it wasn't John? No, it was Charles. I've seen them. They've been meeting every day for weeks. We have been meeting every day for weeks. You admit it, then? Certainly, but not for the reason you think. You're both stupid. And why were you meeting? Charles and I are old friends. And he is an attorney, my attorney. We've been discussing a divorce. Divorce? Yes, I was determined to divorce you. But Charles tried to talk me out of it. We've been arguing for weeks. Certainly. Marge, you're nothing but a silly little troublemaker. I've known that for a long time. Now, maybe you know why I broke off with you, why I stopped seeing you. I wouldn't trust you across the street. Now do you believe me, Tom? Come in. Mr. Norcher. Dr. Elston just died. Just died. Well, I thought he was dead when you found him on the deck. So did I. When I got into his stateroom, he regained consciousness for a few moments. What? Yes. I saw the wave strike, Mr. Norcher. And I also saw what happened just before it struck. Yes, Captain, go on. This man here is Johnson, one of the crew. He was with me when Dr. Elson regained consciousness. Tell him what the doctor said just before he died, Johnson. Well, Dr. Elson said that he was walking ahead of Mr. Northcutt, and just before the wave came over, he turned around suddenly. As he did, Tom, Mr. Northcutt, struck him on the head with something. He fell, and the wave washed him across the deck. That's right. Then he died. Search, Mr. Northcutt, Johnson. This is ridiculous. I own this ship. But I'm the captain. Sorry, Mr. Northcutt. Oh. Here you are, Captain. A gun. Mr. Northcutt, you're under arrest. And you're fired. Both of you. Yes, Mr. Northcutt, that's to be expected. But not until we tie up in New York. It's quite natural that you'll have no further use for this ship after I turn you over to the police. You're a fool. Johnson, radio port officials in New York. And ask Mr. Swenson to put about. Well, Tom, you had a plan. A setup for a perfect crime. But like all so-called perfect crimes, it failed. You jumped to conclusions, worked a little too fast. Marge was wrong in her suspicions, and you followed along without investigating the source of the letter. Now Marge has lost Charles forever, and you have certainly, definitely lost Elizabeth. You deserve what's coming to you. You planned the clues with a diabolical purpose, and furthermore, you did not lose your eyesight. That was a hoax, a trick to trap the man. But very soon you will lose your sight and your hearing and your speech. In fact, you lose all your faculties because you'll be dead. I know. has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual story. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>